All right, we have been uh, looking at the book of Acts. It's been sort of our summer project. We started well, four or five weeks ago, and we're going to go all the way through the middle of July, working our way through the book of Acts. 20, 20 pieces we're doing that. So quick review, if you haven't been with us so far. Uh, Jesus left his disciples with a command and a promise. The promise was that he was going to send them power. All right? The command was that they were to go and to be his witnesses. And so that's what we hear as the story unfolds. First, they received this gift of power, and we saw displays of power and different kinds of healing going on. Uh, We saw the creation of a community of people based on love and care for those most vulnerable among them. Last week, we talked about, we saw how the beginning of persecution came with Stephen being martyred. And with them being martyred, this, this, uh, this tight community in Jerusalem is scattered and they are driven all out into the world, which serves to send the church out into the world as well. If you're with us on Wednesday night, we always we meet on Wednesdays as well, and so uh, in between the stories you've got to read on your own or come on Wednesday to hear what's going on, we are introduced to a guy named Philip. Now, Philip was uh, like Stephen, uh, the guy we heard about last week who, was, who was, um, was martyred, was one of the Hellenists, which means that he was, his language, his culture was not that uh, of, of the Jewish people of Palestine. He lived outside, and so the culture, the language he spoke was different, although he shared, still shame, same, shared the same faith. He is set apart for a ministry of service. Uh, so the disciples could focus on the preaching and the teaching. His main task was to help take care of people. But he's filled with the Spirit, and he ministers powerfully and can't help but give witness to what he has experienced. And we heard stories of that as he, he ventured up into Samaria um, when we gathered on Wednesday. Today we're going to hear how this good news of Jesus finds its way all the way to Africa. All right? Uh, the ancient uh, term for the kingdom there was called Kush. Today we, we call it, it's divided up to different countries that we call it, and we're going to hear in our text today they use um, uh, Ethiopia to talk about that. Now we tend to think about Ethiopia being sort of a, a developing, a, sort of a poor developing nation, but 2,000 years ago was quite a different story. Ethiopia was, what, was a major world power uh, in terms of high culture and wealth a few nations came close to Ethiopia. Europe was barely out of the Stone Age when Ethiopia had high culture and things going on. We're going to hear today about an Ethiopian court official who comes to Jerusalem to worship. There had been a history, even by the time of Jesus, a thousand-year history of the people of Ethiopia making a connection with the Jewish, uh, with the Jewish community. It goes all the way back to King Solomon, uh, receiving visitors from Ethiopia coming and bringing gifts. And so there had been this relationship going on for a thousand years uh, between people of Ethiopia and this Jewish community. Now it drives me crazy that we're not told his name. All right, here's this, we have this wonderful story and they simply, they, they, the, his identity is formed by his geography. He is an Ethiopian, right? Uh, simply say where he, where he comes from. The identity is, is, uh, is described by his vocation. We're going to hear that he is a treasurer, a court official for the queen. Part of his identity is formed by his sex, right? He's, and he's identified as a eunuch, which means he's undergone some gender modification. Because of that, he would have been considered unclean. Even though he wanted to go to Jerusalem to worship, he would not be allowed in the temple because he was a eunuch. He would have to stay on the outside the court of the Gentiles, even if he had been a, a, a convert to Judaism, a proselyte, uh, he would have been considered unclean. Scripture doesn't say he was wealthy, but it was obvious he was. He was riding in a chariot. Normal people don't ride in chariots. Only the wealthy get to do that. And he possessed a scroll. Uh, again, this was something that very few people had uh, a scroll, something in writing. For a person to own a scroll, to have that meant... He had uh, uh, great wealth. And the fact that he could read it means that he had been educated uh, in a time where very few people were literate. Our primary identity, though, is more than simply geography or vocation or sex or economic status. 
Yet that's what's used to describe him here. Identity, our identity is so much more than simply those things. Uh, it comes from our relationship with God. That we are at, our, at the core, we are loved children of God. And that's what we celebrate when we are baptized, right? We say we are baptized children of God. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That comes later in the story. So let's, um, let's hit, read a little bit from the book of Acts. All right, the angel... Um, of the Lord came to Philip said get up go to the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza now this is a wilderness road so he got up and he went now there was an Ethiopian eunuch a court official of the Candice queen of the Ethiopians in charge of her entire treasury he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit said to Philip, go over to his chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I unless someone guides me? He invited Philip to get in and to sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb silent before his shearer he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life was taken away from the earth. So the eunuch asks Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself? Or is it about someone else? And Philip began to speak, starting with the scriptures, and proclaimed to him the good news of Jesus. Let me pause there for a minute. Does it, this part of the story sound familiar at all? Uh, someone making a journey, and on the journey they pause, and they open up the scriptures and, and, uh, as they make their way down the road. Um, this is how Luke told the Easter story that we read a while back, remember? Uh, the disciples are walking down the road. All of a sudden, a visitor comes to them and opens up the scripture and points out where Jesus was being revealed all the way through the scriptures. On Wednesday, we're going to hear another story, a journey story. We're going to hear about a guy named Saul who on the road to Damascus has an encounter with Jesus and he is, life is transformed and changed from a, from a Pharisee who was persecuting Christians into the greatest evangelist the world has ever seen. Luke loves road trips, stories. He loves telling the story of it's on the journey, it's on the process of of going somewhere that oftentimes we're going to encounter Jesus. It's not sitting at home in your living room in an easy chair. It's as we're out and about, as we're moving, God comes and joins us on the journey and helps us see the world in new ways. All right, so that, that's just Luke's little thing. Let's go back to, let's go back to Philip, all right? So Philip asks this really important question, right? He says, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian responds with the reality that all of us know. It's hard reading something that was written centuries earlier. I mean, for the Ethiopian, this was, this was still written 600 years before him, so this was ancient words. You know, it had been written 600 years before, you know, the scroll was 600 years old to a different culture and a different language. How do I figure out what does this mean to me? And that's why we we have sermons. That's why we have Bible studies because it's just hard to do by yourself. Oftentimes we need someone else to help us think this through. What does this mean for us? Others might have insights that I don't. They may help us discover this kind of truth. So let's go back to the story, right? As they were going along the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, here's water. What's to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. As he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. 
All right. So the snatching away business, that's a little weird. All right. Um, but it's a powerful story of witness to what God has done, right? Philip simply tells the story of what he knows. He meets the, this Ethiopian court official where he's at. He doesn't come with his own agenda. He says, well, what is it that you, what is your question, all right? What is it that you need to know? Philip is what we call a, a missionary, right? Now, sometimes that title is used with a little prejudice, um, as someone who goes around pushing, pushing his agenda, all right? Regardless of what the, the person needs or wants. And history is filled with all kinds filled with all kinds of horror stories about missionaries who are not able to separate the gospel of Jesus from Western culture and what we've so oftentimes done in, in, the, in the name of Jesus. There's some terrible kinds of things. But Philip is not that kind of missionary, all right? He is one who has a deep love for the person he is going to. He recognizes that God is already at work in his life. He's not bringing God to this person. God is already working there. He's just helping clarify, helping this person see how God is already, discover what God is already doing. Not to somehow make this Ethiopian official like himself, but to say, what does God have in mind for you? The trouble with organized church is sometimes we try to make things more complicated than it has to be. And that's what happens when you take something which is a movement and turn it into an institution. Then you create all kinds of rules and regulations and, and things like that. Philip is t telling the story of Jesus, and this, this court official interrupts him and says, hey, wait, 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 wait. Here's, here's water. What's prevent me from being baptized? Again, that's a great question, all right? Is baptism a gift of grace, or is it something that we earn or the result of having the right beliefs. Philip doesn't say, oh, no, 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 you can't get baptized yet. You've just heard about Jesus, all right? Uh, you need to take a six-week class on theology before we can baptize you. And I haven't explained the duties of church membership, and I don't have any offering envelopes to give you, and we'd have to get approval from the church council before we baptize you, all right? No, it doesn't say any of that kind of stuff. Uh, baptism is not a barrier between them and us. Baptism is what removes the barriers, things that would separate us. And it has nothing to do with this Ethiopian's geography or his race or his sex or his economic status or even his understanding. He says this is a gift of pure grace, right? that God comes to you and claims you as his own. So Philip says, okay, let's do this. Right? Baptism is not the end result of something. It's the beginning of something. It's the beginning of a journey. A journey that will be different for each of us, but a journey that we do not take alone. One of the things that baptism will do will connect us with other people. One of the things we're going to discover as we journey through this book of Acts is that the Holy Spirit is not big on following rules. All right? Um, it's all, all, everything, every time they think we have a system all figured out, Holy Spirit comes and says, well, no, maybe there's another way we can do this, right? And if you thought this was a big kind of shift, just wait till you see what comes next. It will blow you out of the water. The Holy Spirit takes the, 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 this group of believers and shakes them to the very core, challenging everything that they thought they knew with this radical transformation that changes forever what we know as church. But we are out of time, so you're going to have to come back next week <laughs> Next week to hear about that. Or if you want to read ahead, read Acts chapter 10 and 11. Is this powerful turning point. There's a turning point in the gospel of Acts that changes the whole focus and direction of the church. It's these next couple chapters, chapters 10 and 11 of Acts. And we'll talk about that next Sunday when we get together. All right, let's get the band back up here.